Welcome to episode 229 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agents Walter Lamar and Stephen Chenoweth. In this episode, they review the nationwide manhunt of FBI top 10 most wanted fugitives, Terry Lee Connor and Joseph William Dougherty. Connor and Dougherty met in prison and in the 1980s began working together in one of the most professional bank robbery operations in U.S. history. They would identify the bank manager and where he lived, hold him hostage the night before, and then forcibly escort him to the bank where they would empty out the bank's vault. Connor and Dougherty's well-planned and methodical robberies netted them more than $1 million. After their arrest and then shocking escape from custody, they were placed on the FBI and the U.S. Marshals' top one at fugitives list. Case agent Steve Chenoweth led the investigation and the arrest of Connor in Chicago, and Walter Lamar led the arrest of Dougherty in the San Francisco Division. Walter Lamar served in the FBI for 18 years. He was assigned to the San Diego, San Francisco, Seattle, and Oklahoma City Divisions where he used traditional and sophisticated techniques to conduct, participate, and direct investigations involving violent crimes, fugitives, illegal narcotics, criminal conspiracies, organized crime, public corruption, and domestic terrorism. Twice during his bureau career, Walt was presented the FBI Shield of Bravery for actions taken in the immediate aftermath of the Oklahoma City federal building bombing and during a running gun battle with an armed felon. An enrolled member of the Blackfeet Nation of Montana and a descendant of the Wichita tribe of Oklahoma, Walt left the FBI two years before retirement to accept an appointment as the Deputy Director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Law Enforcement Services. Currently, Walt manages Lamar Associates, a Washington, D.C.-based professional services firm working to assist Indian country prepare for tomorrow while protecting today. Retired agent Stephen Chenoweth served in the FBI for nearly 29 years. Steve was in the Phoenix Division working a variety of investigative and management assignments addressing kidnappings, extortion, bank robberies, major fugitive apprehensions, and other violent crime investigations. He supervised hundreds of bank robbery matters. Later in his career, Steve was the supervisor in charge of the violent crime program in the Phoenix FBI office. After he retired from the FBI, he operated his own investigative firm in Arizona. Steve is now fully retired. Every agent who works criminal cases dreams of arresting a top tenor. This case review is a comprehensive tale of how a new agent with three years in the Bureau and a veteran agent had the opportunity to check off that box. Now, there were many agents and offices involved in this fugitive case, and I want to thank Walt for contacting and mentioning them by name in this episode. This is a two-part episode. I'll post the exciting conclusion next week. Before we get to the interview, I want to ask you to stick around to the very end of the episode to hear a trailer from Rebecca Sebastian the host of the super cool podcast, Dialogue, A True Crime Conversation. I'm doing this promo swap because I truly believe you'll enjoy Dialogue. As you know, I don't do ads on FBI Retired Case File Review. That's because I hope you'll support the show by joining my reader team and purchasing my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books available wherever books are sold. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. 
Once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And when you join my reader team, I'll send you my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 60 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. And you'll also get my FBI reality checklist of 20 misconceptions about the FBI. In my April email, I wrote about my first bank robbery case. In my May Reader Team email, which goes out on Monday, May 3rd, I review how the FBI is portrayed in the bank robbery movie, The Town. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guests, Walter Lamar and Steve Chenoweth. Hey guys, how you doing? Wonderful. Well, people wonder how I get the cases that I review on the podcast, and I get most of my cases by referrals. That's how I learned about Walter and this particular case. It is one of the most complex bank robbery top 10 investigations that I've ever heard about. Well, Jerry, I I first want to thank you, and this is uh, for the listeners, this is Walter. I want to thank you for your kind invitation to be with you today. When you and I first talked about visiting this bank robbery saga of Joseph William Doherty and Terry Lee Connor, I had to naturally set out to refresh my memory of 35 or so years ago. And the first thing I did is I reached out to Steve Chenoweth, who happens to be the foremost expert regarding the bank robbery duo of Connor and Doherty. And after talking with Steve, it it absolutely made perfect sense for him to join us today as we talk about this slice of FBI history. And and Steve and I agreed that, you know, I'm going to lay out the story and he's going to fill in important and interesting detail. And I have to say, Jerry, it's, it's like having the star high school quarterback let me in the game for a little bit. And all of us that have served in the FBI, we know there are a select few agents that we refer to as an agent's agent. And Steve, not to embarrass you, but uh, you are definitely one of those agents and, and you come from that long line of professionals that paved the way for, for our careers. Jerry, as, as we're uh, speaking of careers, I really do appreciate the fact that you and I are of the same generation of agents and attended new agent training near enough to the same time that we know and share many acquaintances. And because we share that same time frame of service in the Bureau, we share similar memories and similar history. So Steve, if, if you wouldn't mind jumping in. And- I'd be glad to. I joined the FBI actually in 1967. Now that was before the FBI Academy ever existed in its, in its present form at Quantico. And we were in a little three-story building there at Quantico back then in the 60s. And so it was an entirely different operation back then. But at any rate, I spent uh, some time in Denver, Colorado as my first office. And then in uh, 1968, I was transferred to Phoenix and arrived here on August 1st of uh, 1968. 110 out, had no air in my car. And so I didn't know whether I was going to like this or not, but it turned out to be a great place. I was assigned to the bank robbery detail in about 1970. And um, in 1971, we had a different kind of robbery. And it was a kidnap hostage robbery where a single bandit had gone to the bank manager's house and rang the doorbell. And, and uh, anyway, he made entry and he took the bank manager and his family hostage and held them overnight. And then the following day, went down to the bank before it opened. And when the appropriate people arrived, he got into the vault and escaped with a little over $70,000. And back then, that was a big, big time robbery with a little different MO. When that case was assigned to me, I was in the Bureau about three, four years at that time. So I thought that was a pretty big case and and I worked it as best I could. Then we had another robbery up in Flagstaff, Arizona, during the summer with the same technique, same guy, obviously. And he got about $55,000 there in that robbery. And then a third robbery occurred in December of 1971 down in Phoenix, Arizona. And a couple of mistakes were made and by the bandit. And and we got a license plate number and found out that he was headed to Yuma, Arizona. 
So we had uh, the local authorities down there set up a roadblock kind of, and, and uh, sure enough, he was apprehended. So I went down to Yuma and interviewed Terry Lee Connor. And that was the first time that I had uh, heard his name, first time that I had actually uh, talked to him. He uh, operated a small little burger chain down there called Burger Boy, and, and it was not going real well. So he needed an infusion of capital. And the best way to do that, he thought, was to rob a bank. But uh, he used that new technique that hadn't been done really before to great success. And uh, so he refined it and, and he did it pretty well. We arrested him and, and charged him and he went away for about 10 years. Walter, when was your first encounter with this type of abduction bank robbery? As as we get started on this, this is not our story. It's not Steve and I's story. It truly is an FBI story. And, and Jerry, you've researched it and, and, and looked at the case. And, and, and I think it's very evident. And you can see that, that it's, that really is an FBI story overall and a, and a real true slice of FBI history. Now, I had a front row seat to part of this case. And as Steve is, is telling, he, he was actually there from the very beginning. When we talk about this case and as we progress through it, you'll see that it involved hundreds of FBI agents at one point or another who worked on this case, were part of this case, and have and carry the memories of this case. And, and so many aspects that of the FBI's considerable resources were assigned and, and deployed at some point in these bank robberies that we're going to be talking about. And you know, Jerry, we never want to forget about that the non-agent component of the FBI family. They are so critical to the function of the FBI. And as we talk about this case, you can imagine that they were involved in in every aspect of it. The movie Bandits with Billy Bob Thornton and Bruce Willis, that movie was actually loosely based on this story that we're going to talk about today. The television shows FBI Files and, and Steve was actually on that show. And as we were talking, some of it was filmed in his house. It was also seen on Unsolved Mysteries. They, they too profiled this robbery duo of Connor and Doherty. So there's a lot of information out there. But I am pretty sure that even though there is all this information out there today, you're going to hear some tidbits that, that haven't previously been talked about in the public domain. That's what I love about these case reviews. Everyone, including me, gets to learn about some of these behind the scenes things. So with that, Jerry, I think it might be helpful for the listeners if I introduce this rogues gallery, kind of the, the main cast of characters in this saga. As Steve mentioned, Terry Lee Connor. Now, now Connor was uh, a white male. He was born in 1943 in Evansville, Illinois. He stood about 6'1", 190 pounds, blue eyes. He's balding, a devil tattoo, and he had a purple rose tattoo on his upper arm. And he listed occupations as a laborer, a restaurant owner, and, and Steve just mentioned that about the fact that he owned these burger joints that were in financial trouble. And in his mind, I guess, what better way to infuse cash into your uh, business than ro start robbing banks? And then he was a salesman, but he was also known as a trafficker of cocaine and heroin. Connor, he was named to the FBI 10 Most Wanted in August 8th of 1986, and that made him the 402nd top 10 fugitive that has ever been listed on the, the top 10 fugitive list. And, and we can talk about the top 10 list uh, a little bit more, Jerry, if you like, uh, as we progress through here. You're saying he got on the list in 1986, but Steve just told us that his first Bank robberies were back in 1971, 1971. So this right. guy, <laughs> this guy <laughs> had a life of crime. I'm telling you, and that's that's what is so uh, interesting and intriguing about this case is that it started, as Steve mentioned, in the 70s, and then there's as, as we're telling the story, we're going to find out about a, a whole a spree of of bank robberies. So, but it wasn't until then, August of 1986. And you'll kind of see how these dates start 
uh, melding together as we talk about the case. But it made him the, the uh, as I said, the 402nd top 10 fugitive. Now, Steve gave us some real insight regarding Connor, and, and he'll be able to give us a little bit more detail as, as we go along. But I think the listeners will agree that Connor was the, the key player in this whole adventure. And, and Steve brought that to light talking about this, this method of, of bank robbery, the kidnap hostage style. Then we have Joseph William Doherty. He pronounced his name Doherty. It's spelled D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. In prison, he was known as Doc. Well, while we were investigating this case, most of us pronounced it Doherty. So forgive me today as I'm, as I'm talking about it. Sometimes I'll bounce maybe back and forth between Doherty and Doherty. I lived in the Philadelphia area for many, many years. And in Philadelphia, it's definitely pronounced Doherty. So, and I think, <laughs> were they from Pennsylvania? Or at least one of them was. I, I think I remember reading. Doherty is a white male born in 1939 in, just as you suggest, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He stood 6'2", 230, and at the time, during this uh, investigation that we were conducting, he had graying, dark hair, blue eyes, and he carried a bullet wound scar in his left knee, and he had a tattoo, Joe, on his upper arm, and for some odd reason, he had the same purple rose tattoo as Connor's. I mean, I don't know what that meant, whether they're in prison, they joined the the prison Purple Rose Club or whatever it was, but they both carried that same tattoo. Doherty had a criminal history dating back to the 60s, and and most of that was robbery and armed robbery. And and he listed his occupations as bartender, laborer, welder, and, and he met Connor in prison where they were both serving time for, as you can imagine, for bank robbery. And though Connor is sort of the main character in this story, Doherty truly is a, is a strong supporting actor and at times kind of became the headliner by default. And you're going to get an idea of, of what we're talking about as, uh, as we get into this. November 6, 1985, Doherty was named to the FBI 10 most wanted, making him the 397th top 10 fugitive. Then we have uh, Robert Barry Butcher, and he's a white male. He was born in 1945, was 6'2", 180 pounds, blue eyes, brown hair. And, and the reason I'm giving you their physical descriptions is, that, you know, I want the listeners to start being able to see these guys and kind of get a feel for them, get an idea of what they're really about. And this guy, he had an extensive criminal history, assault, arm robbery, and was actually even convicted for a conspiracy to commit murder. Well, he served in prison with, guess who, Doherty and Connor. And, and I don't know, Steve, if you'll disagree with this or not, but I kind of saw Butcher as he was a stooge, kind of the gopher kind of fella. And But that, be as it may, he ended up being a very key figure in the case. Both Connor and Doherty needed a third guy in their robberies. They needed uh, somebody in another car that was outside the bank early in the morning keeping an eye and things like that. And so Butcher filled that role for him. So you're, you're exactly right. And, and then we then we uh, come upon this guy, William Fillmore Crouch. Wow, what a guy. He was also known as uh, Wiley Coyote, white male. He was born in 1930, stood 5'8", 165 pounds. And he, and he walked with a limp and he had noticeable scars and, and deformities of his hands. And all this was a result of being shot 13 times by the Seattle police as, as they were attempting to arrest him. I think, I think it was in 1969 or so. And he was in a, in a kind of a dimly lit lounge. The cops recognized him, went up on him, and he started to draw a firearm and they unloaded on him, shot him 13 times. So Crouch, he carried a tattoo of Bill on his forearm and, and, and Jerry, if, if we have time towards the end, I really want to talk about that Seattle shooting because I got to tell you, that really is a wild story. So Crouch was identified as an associate after his name was found in Doherty's contacts after one of Doherty's arrests. And during this time of, that we're going to be talking about of this investigation in 1985, Crouch was described as a vicious career criminal. 
And he'd already been convicted of, of two bank robberies and was connected with an armored car robbery. He was a suspect in a number of murders that he had, none of which he was convicted for. Now, and get this, he had connections to the Hells Angels. He had connections to the Manson family, and word had it at one point he was negotiating with the family to be able to break Charles Manson out of jail. And he had connections with the Symbionese Liberation Army. And if you'll remember, that, that was a group that had kidnapped Patty Hearst. So trust me, he, he had a very storied criminal history. Then we have this guy, Richard Sweezy, and he's just a bit player in this whole larger story. And, and, and he is a white male born in 38. So all of these guys, which would be natural, are kind of around the, the same age range with Crouch being the oldest. Sweezy was an associate of Butcher and Connor, and he met him in, guess where? In prison where he was serving time for bank robbery. There seems to be a pattern there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was released in May of 85, and, and then he was uh, arrested in September of 85 by Special Agent Dan Kraft. And Jerry, I know that Dan has been a guest on your FBI retired case file review, and he talked about his interview with interview or interviews with Jeffrey Dahmer. And I will say this, Dan Kraft, he's another one of those great FBI agents who is a, an agent's agent. Well, Dan arrested Sweezy after a bank robbery that Doherty and Connor committed in Wisconsin. And Sweezy had some of the, the bank money and such. And Dan, his forte was interview. I mean, he was a spectacular interviewer and, and he got Sweezy to confess to participating in two St. Louis robberies with Connor and Doherty and a Wisconsin robbery. Now, I don't want to start getting too far ahead of myself, so I'll quit talking about those robberies. But I find it, and, and I think Jerry and Steve, you'll agree with me, that it's so counterintuitive that so many of these criminals, uh, they tattoo their given name on their body, then they go through all these these hoops to create an alias, to create these these, these, this whole package of false identification. And then how many times have we arrested somebody and they contest their identity? No, no, I'm, I'm William. I'm not James. And you roll up their sleeve and voila, James neatly printed on their arm. And, <laughs> and there we got Doherty and Crouch both with their given names tattooed on their arm. And, and as, as we were laughing about, I mean, you know, this bunch, they all, they all met in prison, serving time for bank robbery. And, you kind of would think that, yeah, maybe that's some kind of a sign, right? Maybe we're not so good at this whole thing and give it up and, and maybe go back to the burger joint or something. But, you know, I just, I find it interesting. And, and when, when we say these guys, what we were referring to a little earlier as, as a bunch of career criminals, I mean, Jerry, I mean, just imagine that, you know, that these guys, Connor and, and Doherty and Crouch, they were robbing banks when you and I were still in high school. And and when you think about Crouch, when I was working this case in mid eighties, I was just past thirty years old. Crouch's first arrest was in nineteen fifty three, before I was even born. And you know, he committed I think his first robbery was was near the year that I was born. And you know, and it's just it's just so crazy. And but I do wanna Steve say to you again, I'm really glad you agreed to be with us here today as we as we tell this story. And maybe you can just talk a little bit more about Connor and Doherty from, from your early days and personal experience. Yeah, certainly. Connor, after his arrest, his initial arrest there in 1971, he went away for about 10 years. And he met Doherty and these other guys in prison. And when they got out, in the early uh, 1980s, clearly Terry Connor had the uh, best method of operation of them all and uh, got more money. Uh, Doherty was just a thug from uh, Philadelphia and he and Connor got along well. And, but with Terry being the brains and uh, Doherty being the uh, brawn primarily, they set out on a series of bank robberies uh, throughout the 1980s, even before their escape and after their escape from Oklahoma City. And they were really the best bank robbers that were working the United States at that time. They did several robberies, and the, the least amount that they got was about a quarter of a million dollars. And so they were very prolific. 
and uh, they were spending a lot of money, but they were getting a lot of money as well. They did a series of robberies, I think, starting maybe in Hazeldale, Washington, in December of 1982, and that's just south of Seattle, and it was billed as the safest bank in Washington, but yet they got hit for about uh, $270,000 or so. Then they moved on and to Oklahoma City there, and that's where Walt uh, was when uh, when that occurred. And Walt, you can tell them a little bit about that robbery there. Jerry, we're going to try to run through maybe a little bit of a, of a timeline and background on these guys regarding these bank robbery sprees and then some of the significant activity that ended up being associated with that, i.e. being arrested. So you rob banks, uh, you get arrested. And, and, and I'll say that Steve mentions that Connor was the brains of, of these two. And we don't want to give the listeners any kind of illusion that these guys uh, weren't anything but idiots. I mean, you, you don't rob a bank if you're if you really are a smart person. Now, in terms of bank robbers, this M.O. and the way they carried it out. Yeah, they were heads and above what most of these robbers are. And Jerry, I know you worked bank robberies. The majority of what we see is a is a, a drug adult junkie that's trying to get a, a heroin fix, and they 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 put together a note and they go in a bank and and walk out with five hundred, a thousand bucks. This is in a totally different class, as as Steve has already mentioned. I'd love to talk a little bit more about this innovative way of robbing a bank, this kidnapping, abduction. I'll go right into that. And then, Steve, of course, while I'm talking about this stuff, if there's anything that uh, you want to mention or draw attention to, please interrupt me. I'll kind of give uh, a little bit of a rundown. And, and Jerry, I got to tell you this, too. I mean, it, that each one of these robberies alone could be a podcast episode. I mean, this case is it's just truly amazing. How many cities and states did they conduct these robberies? So I want to give people a, a good understanding of how prolific and how much area they covered. Well, let, let me run through this little timeline and maybe that'll answer your question. And 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 I'm going to characterize this first group as a string of robberies. And this string of robberies netted them over a million and a half dollars in federally insured dollars. And before I give a, a, the rundown on these, these robberies, you know, Steve talked about this signature style, what that, that, you know, kidnapping bank robbery hostage and now having an idea what this kind of looks like. Oklahoma City is going to sound familiar. And actually, Steve, this was December 28th of 1982 was the Oklahoma City robbery. And it was before I was an agent and I was a clerk in Oklahoma City in 1982 or a support employee. And I actually remember this robbery. The bank manager, Stephen Thompson, he and his wife pulled into the garage at their home and a car quickly pulled up behind them and these two guys in suits, they jump out of the car and they identify themselves as federal agents. Well, the wife is like, uh, hey, can you show me a badge? And that's when Connor pulled a pistol and he ordered the two into their house. And once in the house, they both started quizzing Thompson and he was the manager of the Quail Creek Bank in Oklahoma City. So he's interrogated by these two regarding the operations of the bank. They're asking about, you know, what does it take to open the safe? What are the protocols? Who has access? Asking all kinds of questions about the bank security and so on and so forth. And the Thompsons, the, this husband and wife, and imagine this, these intruders are there in their house pointing firearms at them. And they're telling them that if anything goes wrong and the cops show up, people are going to die. And as Steve alluded to earlier, Connor has had spent his time in prison, 10 years or so, and, and he says he's not going to go back to prison. So that, you know, that, that can make a person very dangerous. Well, they held this couple hostage overnight. So they're with them all night long. And then Connor and Doherty forced the couple to drive them in the manager's car to the bank. Well, Steve mentioned this a little bit earlier that they, they always need to have that third guy. And, and in, in this case, Doherty is on the phone talking to somebody outside and, and somebody outside was acting as a lookout. So this lookout was informing them when somebody would show up, bank employees, 
give uh, a description. Then they'd, they'd meet them at the door with the firearm, bring them in, and then they would quiz each one of these employees. What's your job duties? Can can you get into the vault? Do you have the combination of the vault? Don't do anything. Somebody will die here. Then the next employee shows up. And in this case, imagine this. 30 employees worked at that bank, and they were showing up that morning. And And if you can even think about the idea that maybe one of them took some kind of aggressive action or did, I mean, this thing could have gone completely haywire. And I think that's what's so important as we talk through this. This was an incredibly dangerous situation every time that they were in these banks. Very precarious, very, very dangerous. At one point, an employee shows up who does have the access to the vault. They order a couple of employees to start filling up these large nylon bags and it, and it amounted to over $700,000. So Connor and Doherty, then they, they make their getaway. You know, the, the standard thing, tell everybody to, you know, stay in the storeroom where they're all uh, packed in. Don't do anything. You know, we're going to still be watching kind of a deal. Now, because we don't, and Jerry, you've said this before on some of your podcasts, the FBI doesn't usually talk about the money taken during a robbery. But so much of this story is, is a matter of public record. Those, those dollar amounts are all out there on these cases we're talking about. And I think it kind of adds to the, to the, to the nature of this story, talking about these, these tremendous amounts of, of money that were taken in each of these robberies. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it certainly was. It's, you know, you say crime doesn't pay, but in this particular event, it certainly is netting them enough money that makes you understand why they continue to do it. That's important to, to keep in mind. And, and maybe we, let's talk about that towards the end and, you know, thinking about these dollar amounts. And then we'll ask Steve what, what he thinks. What happened to all this money? But anyway, in Oklahoma City, the case agent assigned to this Oklahoma City robbery was a special agent, T. Michael Cycle. And, and of course, since I worked there, I, I knew him personally. And, and, and just a great all-around fella. I mean, he's one of these guys you'd, you'd want to invite over to a, a cookout. I mean, entertaining, just a really nice, nice guy. And, and on a side note, when he retired from the FBI, of all things, he became a flight attendant. And he'd come into the office after and he would tell us all about the adventures he and his wife would take, you know, from the perks of the job. He'd get to travel all over the place at no cost. And, and he thoroughly enjoyed that. But I always thought to myself, you know, can you imagine these flight attendant workmates as their jaws dropped when he told them, you know, of his former FBI career as he's serving Cokes and, and, and bringing them pillows? <laughs> but anyway, Steve, at this point, maybe you can kind of fill us in a little bit as as you and Mike first spoke when you recognized the MO on this robbery. Yeah. You know, you addressed the money issue there a little bit and, and uh, you know, continuing to do robberies. One thing over my career that I've learned is that if you continue to do this, regardless of what MO you're using in a bank, if you continue to rob banks, uh, you're going to get caught. Almost nobody gets away with it if they continue to do it. And uh, these guys continued to do it. And uh, sure enough, they all got caught. But I had one guy one time tell me that bank robbery was the most addictive drug that he had ever had. Because once you did it, you got away with it, you want to do it again. That just kind of permeates the mind of these guys. Hey, we can do that. We've done it. We'll do it again. Then they keep doing it until something goes wrong when they get caught. That's just a little side note there on bank robbery. But anyway, you know, in answer to your question, Jerry, of where they did a lot of their robberies, they, they, they did them, gosh, Washington, uh, Nevada, uh, Arizona, you know, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, St. You know, Missouri. They were up and down in their career. They were even mentioned by James Patterson, the well-known author, one time in, in, in one of his books when, when his hero was looking for a kidnapped, you know, hostage takers and somebody in his book. Back at the FBI, I mentioned Connor and Doherty. So they were pretty well known in what they were doing. In the Oklahoma City robbery, after a couple other robberies beforehand, I began to recognize that MO. And so I put forth Terry Connor's name. And at that time, 
I didn't really know a whole lot about uh, Doherty, but the, it didn't take long to identify him as as uh, his partner. They continued to to rob banks, but Oklahoma City was a particularly large robbery. When that occurred, an office will notify surrounding offices of what happened. If there's any suspects that they know of, they check with that office and, and put forth a name or two. And of course, it didn't take me long to put forth uh, Connor's name. And so they were identified fairly quickly as being the suspect. But trying to catch him again, that's another, that's a whole different ballgame there. But at least the first part of identifying who it is and who you're looking for uh, was accomplished. And Mike Cycle I did a good job of, uh, of doing that. And it's amazing how things, uh, how people cross paths. Mike Cycle, before he went to Oklahoma City, was an agent here in Tucson, Arizona, back in the 60s. And I knew him well uh, when he worked down in Tucson. I was in Phoenix, but went down to Tucson on several occasions and had an opportunity to meet uh, Mike. And uh, great guy, you know, for sure. One of the things that I'll point out that was so important about Steve's knowledge of Connor as these bank robberies unfolded, Steve was the go-to guy to be able to identify these robberies by MO and help connect them and then help the agents that were working the cases with this institutional history about Connor and then adding Doherty to the mix. But one thing I do, I will mention that now that Connor is, is mentioned, you know, when, when we're investigating these, these bank robbery cases, if, if a suspect or, or subject of investigation is in custody, then, you know, we do a live lineup. And, and, you know, the listeners, you've seen those on television where you have these six characters all lined up and, you know, turn to your right, turn to your left kind of a thing. And you have that live lineup of witnesses. Well, in a case like this one where Steve presents a name, and you have a photograph, well, then a photo spread is used or a photo montage. And the, the suspect or subject is included in this montage of photographs. And, and as it happens, typically it, they're all mug shots. In this particular case, Connor was indeed picked out of a photo spread. And in addition to the photo spread, the physical description, the, the past bank robberies and the same MO, it, it resulted in arrest warrants for both Connor and Doherty. And Connor was known to have some California connections. And Jerry, you know, when when the FBI is looking for bank robbers, particularly in a case like this with a monster take like that, the word goes out across the Bureau to be on the lookout for these guys and be looking for any kind of robberies with similar MOs and such. But a more concentrated effort was undertaken in California to find these guys out there because of, of Connor's previous connection there. And that's when uh, Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer comes into the picture. And because I was assigned in San Francisco, I knew Harlan, great guy, good, solid investigator. Well, he was assigned the case to chase down Connor out there on the, on the West Coast. Well, it turns out Connor did, in fact, have a female friend in the Monterey, California area. Freimeyer Good, solid investigator went out and did the, the bread and butter FBI investigation, talking to neighbors that a girlfriend and conducting investigation, determined that she planned to meet up with Connor. Now, this is after the Oklahoma City robbery. And she ended up driving several cars, but one of them actually had an Oklahoma license plate on it. Well, her cars were outfitted with tracking devices. She was kept under 24 seven surveillance for some period of time, probably a week or so, anticipating this meetup with Connor. And Connor and Doherty and their associates, I'll say this, were all incredibly alert to surveillance, and they took all kinds of measures to either expose or defeat any such effort. So as I'm talking about surveillance, as we're going through this whole story, and it's unbelievable the amount of time that at any at any given time during this investigation, how many people were under 24-7 surveillance. It just is a true testament to the professionalism of those agents working this difficult task to never be exposed during this entire time. I mean, it just is an amazing uh, feat that they were able to carry out these surveillances without ever being made. So it's now March of 83, and it's just over two months from the Oklahoma City robbery. And Connor's lady friend hopped in one of those cars one day and she took off heading south down the coast. And of course, 
when you know it, the ground units lost sight of her and they lost sight of the electronic signal. Well, we know, you know, what happens then. It's a full court press. Everybody's scrambling and scrambling to regain the, the sighting of the car or the signal. And especially in a case like this. Well, thankfully, they were able to, that full court press paid off and they found her still heading south. And she's driving south and she's like over a hundred miles or so, Monterey to Tuscadero, California. She parked her car and disappeared on foot. You can imagine when you got agents that are in cars and they're, they're following what they can't just drive right straight into the parking lot, jump out and follow her. They've got to get situated. So they, they lost sight of her. Now they have no idea what's going to happen next, but they're pretty sure that she's going to meet up with Connor. So while they're waiting for other assigned agents, they've got a SWAT team on standby to, and everybody's getting situated. And of course, they don't, they don't want to get caught ill prepared. So. One of the agents jumped out of their car, ran over, and let the air out of one of her tires. Well, as it turned out, that was a perfect move. So after waiting and and waiting, Connor actually pulls up with the woman in another car, and he notices the flat tire. He gets out, and he's going to change the tire before he takes off. And as he's preparing to do that, the, the SWAT agents surprised him, took him into custody. So as we say in the FBI, he was arrested without incident. The upside to this is he had the trunk open in his car because he was uh, getting the jack and such out. Money was found in the car. In plain view. In plain view, absolutely. And had serial numbers from the Oklahoma City robbery. So bingo. I mean, this tied him tight and tied it up with a red ribbon that he's a guy that is going to be con- absolutely going to be convicted of that robbery based on all this evidence. In that car was a receipt for a car purchase, and it had an address in Santa Maria, California. And, and, and the investigation and such, they believe that that's probably where Doherty was. So investigation was quickly initiated at that address in, in Santa Maria. They developed probable cause and the agents hit that house. And it was evident that somebody had probably been there and left in a big hurry. So obviously, Connor or the girlfriend tipped him off and he was off into the wind. Now we've got Connor in custody. Doherty is is in the wind. Steve, what was going on in your mind? You know that Connor's in custody, Doherty's on the run. And then (laughs) eight or so months later, what happens in Phoenix? Yeah, well, we had another robbery in Phoenix with the uh, same M.O. I responded to that and heard the description and what happened. This was just right around Thanksgiving time, 1983. Knew immediately who it was. We uh, showed some pictures and uh, in a lineup, and uh, sure enough, it was Doherty. So we didn't know who the second person was because uh, he had to latch on to somebody else, and he wasn't as good as Connor was in doing the research that was necessary to be successful in some of these robberies. And it takes a little bit of time to um, kind of scout these banks and find out who's who and go inside and get a little bit of the lay of the land and find out who the manager is and who the assistant manager is and then follow them because they had to know where they lived. So they did a fair amount of research prior to the actual robbery itself. It's worth noting as well that uh, it wasn't just the bank manager, maybe his wife, but there were kids involved. Several of these managers had children, and they were taken down to the bank as well. It was a frightening situation. At the time of this new Phoenix robbery, Connor's already in jail. That's correct. How many robberies, was it just, and and I don't want to say just, but was it the Oklahoma City robbery, and now the Phoenix robbery? Or were there other robberies in between those before Connor is uh, arrested in California? It was kind of the one and done, the Oklahoma City robbery, and then the good work of the the agents and the investigation, Connor gets arrested. You know, I I found it um, odd that Doherty robbed the bank in, in Phoenix, where the foremost expert on these guys is uh, is an FBI agent. Went back to the early scene of the crime. Exactly. And then in May of 84, there was a robbery at Salt Lake, same MO. Doherty, again, it was him. In February 19th of 85, there was a robbery in Reno, Nevada. Doherty, 
again. And in this case, the bank manager had a, a bomb strapped to it. And this bomb is, is one of these, you know, Acme bombs that we see in the cartoons with the ticking clock and the, you know, the red sticks of dynamite kind of thing. Well, thankfully it was, it was inert. But again, you know, I want to emphasize, you know, how dangerous these guys were and they, they were known to carry assault rifle. I mean, it's, you know, they, they are armed and very, very dangerous. And now we've got this whole idea of explosives in the mix. Yeah. Being that Connor was in, in custody, it kind of put, uh, Joe, a little bit behind the eight ball because he had to find somebody else that can fill Terry's role and do it as well in order to continue doing some of the robberies. But that part kind of came to an end for Joe in December because we continued to look for him. And the marshals, U.S. marshals were involved in the, in the search as well. We had known that Joe Doherty had a habit of wherever he lived, kind of stepping outside sometimes, especially if it was in a rural area, and just discharging a weapon shooting at a tree, shooting at a branch, whatever the case may be. He had a history of doing that. And the investigation to locate Doherty up to Colorado Springs into the Black Forest there just outside the springs. And that's a a very dense area, a lot of trees. Doherty by this time had fathered uh, a young child with his girlfriend. So we found the three of them living in the Black Forest out there. and, And we surrounded the place. I was just in the rear there, of course, because we had SWAT team members and so forth there. And and at one point, Doherty opened up the door, pulled out a gun, and began firing just indiscriminately. We had the place surrounded. But everybody was really good because they were aware of what he had uh, done in the past and just you know stepping outside and shooting the gun. So the order went out to, to hold your fire, hold your fire, and everybody did. And he didn't know we were there. And... But we had to duck for cover, that's for sure. Then he fired a few rounds, went back into the house, so everything was was okay. Well, eventually, his girlfriend left. The child did not. Stopped her, found out that, yeah, he was there, and the child was there. And They made contact with Doherty, and he ultimately surrendered, realizing that a gunfight would be futile. Good chance that his child might be hurt and injured. So he gave it up. And he was taken into custody and taken on down to the El Paso County Sheriff's Department and put in jail. Well, I had kind of wanted to talk to him with respect to the Phoenix robbery, because that's uh, one of the warrants that were outstanding for him. So I wanted to talk to him a little bit about that. He knew who I was when I was in the jail area there and uh, going to the cell. He got right up. He, He wanted a piece of me. I recognized that right away, and I just turned around said to the deputy, hey, he's all yours, you handle him. And, uh, so they they took care of him, but uh, I never got a chance to interview him with respect to that Phoenix robbery. But he was by far, in a way, the more violent type person. He, he was prone to more violence than, than Terry was. So getting him off the street was a priority. And working with the marshal's office and everything that, that occurred, and we were glad to get him off the street for sure. The, the both of them were back in custody, so the next thing would be a, a trial in Oklahoma City. Now, Walt, you were an agent in San Francisco by the time you became directly involved in this. Had they done this type of kidnapping, abduction, bank robbery in the San Francisco area? Not in uh, the San Francisco area, but earlier on, I said that, you know, I had a front row seat to some of this. Steve had more than a front row seat. He was actually in the arena. And Jerry, I think you'll agree. And knowing what the FBI was like back in this time frame in the in the eighties, it was pretty unusual for an agent to migrate out of their division and end up in another division on an arrest. And and I think this speaks to as the bureau is starting to recognize Steve's understanding of this case that Steve was actually up there in Colorado when Doherty was arrested. You know, I, I just think that speaks volumes that Steve was able to do that. Trust me, I tried to do a lot of times. They wouldn't let me go. <laughs> so now we're at June 19th of 1985. Doherty is, is awaiting trial in Oklahoma City for that Oklahoma City robbery. And again, because of Steve's key role in this, Steve is there in Oklahoma City waiting for Connor and Doherty to show up. And the reason that Connor was there is Doherty 
had him subpoenaed to be there with him at this trial. And it turns out they were both at the federal penitentiary in El Reno, Oklahoma. I was back there mainly to just, you know, provide some expertise with respect to these guys and, and who they are and what they've done and what their MOs were and things like that. And to answer any questions and to help with the prosecution of the case. So I was back there and they were supposed to be on a bus uh, coming out to the courthouse from El Reno and they were not on that bus. So a couple of marshals had to be summoned to bring them out and they brought them out in the back seat of a car. But Connor had secured a handcuff key and where he got it, I don't know, but uh, he had a handcuff key and then they had a, uh, a razor blade as well. They were both put in the back seat of the uh, marshal's car. While they were driving, marshals had their heads turned forward. Connor was able to escape from his uh, shackles or his handcuffs. And then using the razor blade, they were able to overpower the marshals and uh, pull them off the road and escape. During that escape, they the marshals' IDs and they took their guns and they handcuffed the marshals to a tree and then left them out there. But at least they didn't hurt them and then made their escape in the marshals' car. When I was watching the FBI Files episode, I was wondering why in the world were these two former criminal partners in the backseat of a car together? The fact that they missed this transport bus to the courthouse, I mean, that seems like maybe that was something that was orchestrated. Yeah, I, I don't know about that part. Jim Volz from Oklahoma City was, was the case agent at that time. I don't know whether they ever checked the background on that as to why they missed that bus or, or just what happened. But yeah, I think that's an area of concern, certainly with, with two guys like this who had a propensity for violence. I would have probably taken a little more precaution, but hindsight, you know, that's everything. So yeah, they got away. I was waiting for them in the courthouse there and somebody came up to me and told me they escaped. And I said, what? I said, yeah, they've, they've escaped from the marshals as they were being brought in from El Reno. I was very surprised about that. And, and uh, I kind of hung around for uh, a day or so just in case they got caught. But uh, that didn't happen. I remember telling Jim Holtz, I said, well, Jim and Jerry, as you know, when a crime is committed, it's the office where the crime was committed that takes responsibility for the investigation, whether it be the investigation itself or the attempt to locate and apprehend them. And since it all occurred in Oklahoma City's territory, Oklahoma City would have been the uh, office of origin and been responsible for the handling of that. So a day or two later, I, I told Jim, I said, well, Jim, you've got a tiger by the tail here. Good luck to you. And I then uh, got on a, uh, a plane and went back to Phoenix, Arizona, because I had no process on these guys. The only process I had was uh, the one on Doherty there for the robbery in 1983. And of course, we arrested him in December of 1984. So I had no further process. So I was on the plane back to Phoenix, getting ready to take some annual leave. Days later, I, I get a call from uh, the Bureau from Washington. It was a fellow by the name of Don Pierce. And he was the unit chief back there in uh, Washington. And he said to me, we are making you office of origin with respect to the capture of Doherty and Connor. And I mentioned to Don, I said, Don, I don't even have process on these guys. And it didn't occur in my area here in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. It, it, it occurred in Oklahoma City. I said, they, they should be office of origin on this. I said, well, you know more about these guys than anybody else. And, and you're, you're, you're better equipped to, to look for them than probably anybody else. So I said, oh, man, okay. I was initially a little bit reluctant to do this because there's going to be a load. I knew uh, they were not easy to find. So with that, I now had responsibility for finding both Terry Connor and Joe Doherty. I set to work to find them. Right after this escape, and, and Steve mentioned that wasn't sure where the handcuff key came from. Well, I, I had a, a high school classmate that turned out to be a ne'er-do-well, and he was in the El Reno Penitentiary with Connor and Doherty. And he got out of prison at one point in 1992. He got in a, and this is my high school classmate, got in a shootout with the cops in Colorado. And I ended up with the case, chased him down and arrested him in, in 92. And he's been in prison ever since. So occasionally he and I speak on the phone and he was telling me that he was a big fan of Houdini. So he always had a handcuff key and he provided the handcuff key to Connor. Oh, they, really? 
<laughs> I haven't heard that before. <laughs> well, nobody knows it because the only person that he's ever told that is me on the phone that he gave him the handcuff key. And, you know, I, and I have a tendency to actually believe it. But after they escaped, they took the, the marshals and, and, and it was kind of a, a twist because as Steve has said, for the most part, Doherty was the, the thug and, and probably the, the more violent of the two. But it turns out, according to the marshals, it was Connor who suggested that they kill the marshals. And it was Doherty that said not to do it, just handcuff them to a tree and leave them. So now they've got the marshals car, they've got the marshals badges, identification and guns, and they, they take off. First thing they do is they end up at a, at a service station and they carjacked a car there an arm takeover of the car. They grab a car. Now they take off in it. They end up later taking a couple in Oklahoma City hostage in their Oklahoma City home. And they were with this couple for 20 hours after after they'd escaped. And during that time, they're visiting with the couple. And at one point, Doherty's saying, let me help out washing dishes. And I mean, it was just like this totally surreal a situation with this poor couple and these these two crazy escapees, escape bank robbers, and they've got them in their house all night long. And so the next morning, before they took off in one of the couple's cars, they handcuffed them to the steering wheel of their car and and told them, "Hey, listen, you might be able to get loose from here, but you know we've been really good to you, so you know why don't you please give us at least three hours to get away." I don't know if they if they actually gave them that time or not, but they then dumped that stolen car in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and then they forced a guy. To, so when I say forced, they kidnapped the, uh, a man and made him drive them to Kansas City. And of course, being the good sports they were, they gave him uh, two hundred dollars for his trouble. And I don't know if that two hundred dollars came from the marshal's pockets or uh, from the couple in Oklahoma City, but they gave this guy a couple hundred bucks for his trouble. You can only imagine how embarrassed the, the marshal service was over losing these two guys, these two high profile bank robbers. So they were immediately named to the U.S. Marshals top 15 list. And the marshals were working this case under the code name of Condor. Right after the escape, this case was then assigned a, a major case designation by the FBI. And it was a major case Doe Rob. And so we were working it under Doe Rob. And it really is, I got to tell you, very Jerry, and you'll agree that it was very unusual that the office of origin for the case was transferred out to Phoenix. So once again, testaments to Steve's knowledge, understanding, and, and the Bureau recognizing that knowledge and understanding of these robbers to make Phoenix OO and Steve the OO case agent. And just as an aside, for the listeners, the, we have the Office of Origin, and that's the central investigative hub in cases. Then you have the Auxiliary Offices, or AO, and the Office of Origin is typically the one sending out leads and, and kind of orchestrating these investigations. Well, I mentioned that I was in San Francisco, and having had an opportunity to be a support employee in the FBI, I understood the administrative workings of the FBI pretty well. So as an agent, I made it a habit of getting to the office real early. I would go to the teletype room and I would get into the teletypes and I would read teletypes. And I was shop, what I was shopping for is, you know, locate an arrest or, you know, some big case of interest. And then I would hand carry it over to the supervisor and say, uh, you know, I just ran across this case and I did a little background on it. I'd, I'd like to be assigned to me. Well, after this escape, I saw the teletype describing the escape. I hand carried it over to the supervisor and asked him to assign me the case. And he probably thought, and I was, I had three and a half years in the bureau at that point as an agent. And I'm sure the supervisor probably thought, yeah, no harm done. We're, you know, we're just going to be watching from afar as this thing unfolds. I'll give it to the kid. Now I'm assigned a case agent in San Francisco. You're actually assigned the fugitive investigation. I'm assigned the AO fugitive investigation. So the auxiliary office of San Francisco, the fugitive investigation. In a, in a major case like this, Jerry, you'll recall that all office teletypes would be going out keeping everybody informed. So on the major cases, everybody uh, stayed up to date what was going on. 
And that was kind of my job at that point in San Francisco was just to monitor the teletypes coming in, keep track of what was going on with the case, just in the event something might happen in San Francisco that we'd be spun up on it. We are at a point now where we've been talking for a while, and I think this is a great cliffhanger. We've got the two bank robbers, Terry Connor and Joe Dougherty at large. We have the marshals looking for them. We have the FBI looking for them, and they're in the wind. So why don't we stop the episode now, and we will pick this back up and continue what is now, instead of just a bank robbery investigation, we're also now doing a fugitive investigation. What I'd like to do now is to switch things up a bit. So at this episode, we'll talk to Steve about when and why he joined the FBI. And at the end of the second episode, I'll talk to Walt about when and why he joined the FBI. So Steve, you're up. Well, I graduated from college in June of 1963. And in August of 1963, I went to work for the Office of Naval Intelligence, which is the precursor to what is now known as NCIS. And uh, most people know it by the television show there with Mark Harmon. But I was assigned down to Long Beach for the most part for three and a half years and uh, investigated basically violations of the UCMJ by Navy personnel as well as Marine Corps personnel. So I was consistently at the U.S. Naval Station in uh, Long Beach and the shipyard in Long Beach and at the Marine Corps Air Station out in El Toro. Our physical office was located in the federal building in uh, Long Beach. And right down in the floor below us was the FBI resident agency of Long Beach. We happened to park our cars in the same parking lot. So I got to know some of those guys. And as the years kind of went by, I always thought it would be kind of neat I kind of envied their cars. Their their cars were better than ours. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, that'd be kind of neat. And so they recruited me. I was glad to make the swap. At the time, when I went up to the FBI in Los Angeles to apply, I was interviewed. And But I was only 24 years old. And you had to be 25 at that time in order to enter on duty was for the FBI as an agent. So in September of 1966, I received a letter from the Bureau from J. Edgar Hoover, just a, a form letter, appointing me to a class that would begin in February, actually February 13, 1967. Well, my birthday is February 7, and so I turned 25 on February 7, and then six days later on the 13th, I entered on duty. But the class that I was assigned had to start after my my 25th birthday in order for me to be eligible to become an FBI agent. For the most part, the FBI Academy back then was a few weeks in Quantico in a small building, and then and then the rest of the time in the old post office building and the Department of Justice building. So we kind of bounced around back there a little bit. So it was a lot different from what the FBI Academy is now. And then I was assigned to Denver, and I spent about 12 months in Denver, arrived here I think, around August 1st, 1968. So I've been here ever since, and it's been a great career. And in the midst of all this uh, top 10 chase of Doherty and uh, Connor, I became a supervisor of the violent crime squad. I, I had been attached to the bank robbery squad most of my career. And uh, so I became a, a supervisor August of uh, 1986. But I still continued on on the search for the top 10s. It was a good career, and I retired in 1995. Once you retired, what did you do? Well, I retired. After 28 and a half years with the Bureau and then three and a half with the Navy, for the first four months, which would be the latter part of 1995, I really didn't do anything. I had never stayed home and done nothing because every year when we had a vacation, I always took time and, and we went camping, we went uh, fishing, we traveled up to Canada with our kids and, and everything. So I never stayed home. Well, for four months, I stayed home and I thought, oh, wow, this is pretty good. But I formed a business of my own. I had a name recognition out there here in, in the area. And so I did some work for myself, investigative consulting type work. And then I hooked on with some other folks where I did work for them as well. I ultimately became associated with Work Dynamics out of Kansas City, Missouri. Did a lot of work in the healthcare industry and traveled the country. And I also was one of those who 
in the early part of the Catholic abuse crisis, starting back in the early uh, 2002 time frame. I did work for the uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops in uh, traveling to uh, different dioceses to make sure that they were in compliance with the uh, charter that they had affected as to how they were going to handle the situation. So I spent about um, eh, eight, nine years doing that, but I've been retired totally since 2010. And my wife and I enjoy traveling. We've got two children and 10 grandchildren and one great grandson and another great grandson on the way. So it's been a good life. Well, I like to give my guests the last word in this episode. You get the last word. So what would you like to say? Well, Walt and I talk a little bit about being, uh, is, is this the best case you've ever had and what have you? It's certainly one of the best cases that I ever had. It is one of those defining cases in, in a career. So it's a case that I will remember for all of my life. As a matter of fact, on my wall, I have that top 10 poster of Terry Connor that he did sign. I also have one of Doherty that remains unsigned. That's it. And I enjoyed being with you, Jerry, very much. And that's the end of part one of this episode. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Walt Lamar and Steve Chenoweth and longer versions of their bios. You'll also find links to the FBI website page about the Most Wanted program, articles about the hunt for and capture of Connor and Doherty, their official top 10 wanted flyers, a link to the movie Bandit, inspired by this case, and a link to more FBI Retired Case File Review episodes about fugitive investigations. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books in your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, Fun for Armchair Detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Do you love true crime podcasts but could do without the chatty banter? Are you intrigued by what's underneath our collective true crime obsession and want to hear field experts, authors, and content creators weigh in on the matter? Well, it might be time for you to kill the small talk and join the dialogue. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, host of Dialogue, a true crime conversation. It's a weekly podcast where I speak with fascinating guests from the true crime world and the criminal justice system. Together, we explore the genre itself and attempt to answer the why of true crime and also the question, what are we even talking about when we talk about true crime? Join me every Wednesday for a new episode and a killer conversation. Dialogue is available wherever you listen to podcasts.